guys! Welcome to ANCS 375, Ancient Medicine, or in this case, Roman Medicine, because this is a short course. I'm just going to focus on one culture at a time. I'm Dr. Jones Lewis. You can call me Dr. Jones Lewis or Dr. JL, and uh, let's get on with this. Here we go. Oh, also, my kitty is here, so this is Tethys. She's a tabby. Yes. All right, here we go. All right, let's jump right in uh, with the backstory. So this is going to be the really, really, really quick historical background that you need to know to understand what's going on in the medical marketplace of ancient Rome. This has to do with a philosophical movement that gets going in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, this isn't by any stretch of the imagination the beginning of medicine, or even the beginning of medicine in the Mediterranean. We have evidence of uh, Neanderthals treating each other for medical conditions, and likely Homo erectus was doing it. Uh, like. As long as human beings have been able to figure out that grog has been hurt and maybe we should try to fix that, there has been medicine. Uh, likewise, the ancient Mediterranean doesn't invent medicine. Uh, medicine is independently developed in many cultures all over the globe. This is just one of many. A very influential one due to historical factors that I'm not going to get into too much here. So suffice to say, if you're looking for a story of medicine that starts with the ancient Greeks invented medicine, this, this is not that story. Instead, what's going on is that in the Eastern Mediterranean, not even mainland Greece is where this started, but rather along the coast of Ionia, that's the coast of modern day Turkey facing the Ionian Sea, the Mediterranean, there is an intellectual movement that's born of a high concentration of cultural diversity and trade mobility because the Ionian Sea is part of a sea route going into the Black Sea, which is itself fed from multiple regions inland in Eurasia. So we have an active trade zone feeding into the Mediterranean, which means that people are coming from long distances, bringing information and goods and languages and cultural ideas all together into these trading zones, which themselves form units of ethnic diversity within the coast of Ionia itself. You have Greek-speaking colonists living alongside um, more indigenous Lydians. At one point, this area was under the control of the Persian Empire as well. And then these are all linked into the greater Mediterranean trade network too. So it's not just about Ionia, but Ionia's trade contact with Egypt and via Egypt, uh, East Africa, down the Nile rather up the Nile because the, the Nile flows south to north. But then also into the Western Mediterranean, you have contact with the Atlantic seaboard up into Britain, south along the coast of West Africa. The Mediterranean Sea facilitates this exchange of ideas that leads to uh, the invention of what I'm going to call rationalizing medicine. That is an approach to understanding the human body that attempts to explain what's going on in the body using logical processes that are informed by observations in the natural world beyond the body. The way this manifests in the Greek-speaking tradition brings us to what we call the Hippocratic tradition. Now, the version of this you've probably heard is that a doctor named Hippocrates invented medicine. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not true either. There were Greek doctors who predated Hippocrates that everyone in ancient Greece knew about. Like, this isn't a secret or anything, but it's... Um, a messier story to tell than Hippocrates fathered medicine. What Hippocrates does seem to have done is founded a, a working group of doctors that was probably based off of the island of Kos in some way. Uh, he does seem to have been a historical person, but the writings that we have listed under the name of the author Hippocrates 
were not themselves written by Hippocrates. And people in the ancient world knew this. What they used the name Hippocrates for was a convenient way of labeling this collection of written medical sources that came out of the tradition of Hippocrates, his students, his followers, his colleagues, and this wider environment of um, medical researchers who were trying to use developments in philosophy to figure out a way of approaching the human body that didn't rely so much on tradition and ritual and belief and custom, but instead tried to harness uh, this assumption that the universe works according to rules, rules that are independent of necessarily divine intervention, and that if you understand these rules, you can figure out more effective ways of treating and preventing illness. This is like the, the first half of the course in the semester, so this is the really short version. Sorry, guys. Okay. The takeaway idea from this, the thing that you need to know that I'll be asking you about, the Hippocratic Corpus is the name that we give to writings coming out of 5th and 4th century Greece in the Eastern Mediterranean. You'll hear them described as the writings of Hippocrates. They aren't. They're written by anonymous doctors. They didn't sign their work. These writings were collected into a volume that seems to have been collated at the Library of Alexandria and then spread out to libraries around the Mediterranean as kind of this collected best of the Hippocratics desk set. And it's these writings that heavily inform subsequent developments in Greek and later Roman medicine. But there isn't really a standardized approach to the human body, even within these texts. It's part of how we figured out that there are multiple authors, both because ancient people talk about multiple authors, but also if you read a given text in the Hippocratic Corpus, it's going to tell you a slightly different version of how the human body works and how to treat it. Even the one thing that you may have heard about Hippocratic medicine, the idea that the body is made up of these four humors that come together in mixtures to determine health and illness, that isn't standardized in the Hippocratic Corpus. Some authors have three humors, some have six, some of them disagree about what the humors even are, some of them don't talk about humors at all. That's uh, because this is a very early stage in the development of rationalizing medicine. And we're never going to get to a stage that's going to look particularly familiar to modern people. A lot of the stuff we take for granted today, including the scientific method, yeah, the way by which we test whether or not a scientific idea is valid or ridiculous, that isn't here yet. They're still kind of working out what the scientific method is, what constitutes proof, what's the relationship between a theory and a fact. All of this is still being worked out, and these authors are tossing around ideas that they're then using and applying in a very experimental way in their own practices, and then they're staying in communication with each other through written communication, but also they're traveling around meeting each other and talking to each other. So these are the collected wisdom of a few generations of Greek speaking physicians who are laying the groundwork that's going to drive the way certain kinds of medical professionals look at the human body. Now, this is a really influential way of doing it, although they don't get to the scientific method, this is where the scientific method begins. This is still where we take the basis for a lot of what we consider scientific medicine or mainstream medicine. Um, sometimes you'll hear it called allopathic medicine. That is the kind of medicine that your insurance company will willingly pay for most of the time if you're lucky and your insurance is responsible. So I'm not 
gonna be able to describe to you everything about Hippocratic medicine. What I'm gonna do instead in the next couple slides is give you the most influential idea to come out of Hippocratic medicine that you're gonna need to know about to understand what's going on in the Roman period. Um, ancient science doesn't stay still. There's technological progress year by year by year. Fifth century medicine doesn't look like fourth century medicine. And although these Hippocratic writings continue to be used and quoted and referred to, subsequent scientific endeavors supersede the Hippocratics in some cases. Um, just like today, medicine changes. We know more, we do more, we do what we can with the information we have. Ancient people are no different. Scientific progress isn't a modern thing. Um, also, while I'm at it, the Middle Ages, things didn't stop. People kept making scientific progress in the Middle Ages, just mostly in Arabic. So there's that, but that's another class. Okay, so here we are. The big idea to come out of Hippocratic medicine as it gets codified and used most commonly in Roman medicine. Oh, sorry. Um, before we get to that, we're going to talk about the Hippocratic Oath. If you've heard of any one Hippocratic writing, it's the Hippocratic Oath, yeah? Uh, first thing, I'm going to disabuse you about the Hippocratic Oath. Nowhere in the text of the Hippocratic Oath does it say do no harm, which is the one thing that everybody seems to think is in the Hippocratic Oath. Like, you can do a drinking game to medical shows where they're like, your Hippocratic Oath says do no harm. Actually, it doesn't. It is a Hippocratic saying. It's just in a different piece. It's in Epidemics 3. So you can bring that up in conversation. It'll make you really popular. Trust me. Uh, the Hippocratic Oath, then, is a 5th century text. It's very old. However, Everything else you know about it is likely wrong. Um, starting with the do no harm thing, that line isn't in it. As close as it gets is this one clause where it says, I will work for the benefit of my patients and try to uh, protect them against damage. Close, sorta. Now, we have no evidence at any time in the ancient world, that's the world before 200 CE, which is the cutoff for this course um, with the death of Galen and maybe 216. Nobody seems to be taking this as a routine part of their medical education. Uh, first, medical schools don't exist in the ancient world. In fact, they don't really exist. They you kind of get them in the universities of medieval Islam and eventually cathedral schools in the European Middle Ages, but you don't get accredited medical schools that give you an MD degree until the 1900s. It's a lot more recent than you might think, as is medical accreditation. In fact, you can't accredit people with a medical degree in a period before you agree on how the human body works there's no agreement on this in the ancient world. So certifications aren't really a thing, which doesn't mean there's not quality control. It just doesn't look like it does to us. Okay, so back to the Hippocratic Oath then. This doesn't seem to have been something that people routinely swore to. Uh, maybe there might have been a splinter sect using it at some point in the fifth century, but part of why we say this is that first, there's no mention of this document outside of this document until we get to the first century CE. So that's like 600 years where nobody talks about its existence, which means that probably people aren't swearing it routinely. Because if you're swearing an oath not to kill your patients, you're gonna publicize that, yes? So there's no external evidence. Also, the practices that we see ancient doctors endorsing and talking about in their medical writings directly break many of the provisions in the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, first and foremost, this idea that you shouldn't give your patients something to end their life, the idea that euthanasia is bad, is something we don't see ancient doctors adhering to. Euthanasia seems to have been a regular part of medical practice in all periods that we're going to be dealing with. 
Uh, similarly, the Hippocratic Oaths text involves a prohibition against uh, abortifacient pessaries, which is a vaginal suppository to induce an abortion. We know about these because there are hundreds, actually it's more like thousands of recipes for how to make this floating around in medical literature from the 5th century on as a regularly discussed and frequently used part of women's health care. So, uh, yeah, that's two big things in the oath that doctors aren't doing. Also, their vow not to talk about what happens at their patient's bedside. Regularly, doctors in ancient texts will tell you about this one time I was treating Bob from Abdera. And so HIPAA has a, a long way to go before it's enforceable. So what is this text for, you may then ask. If, if we're not swearing it as an oath, what's going on? Well, this seems to have been a literary genre that comes out of the religious life of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Greater Mediterranean era, area. It's likely a genre that's being used as an early statement of medical ethics in an attempt to tie medical ethics to religious adherence and religious enforcement. At the very beginning of the oath, it calls on Apollo and various healing deities to witness the oath and to come after you if you don't follow the oath. Now, this was likely in an effort to educate hopeful doctors about uh, best practices in a, an informal way. It might have also been a way of reassuring patients that doctors were uh, held to a higher ethical standard. One of the things in the oath that does seem to have been followed is the doctor swears not to rape their patients or anybody in their patient's house. This tells you a lot about the kind of trust issues that ancient doctors had to deal with because, and this is still a thing in medicine, we trust doctors with the level of access to our bodies that we don't allow other people, even people that we're making children with, uh, our lovers, our immediate family members, often we don't let them do to our bodies the kinds of things we let doctors do to us, certainly surgeons, at least I hope not. I don't want to yuck your yum, but be safe. <clears throat> so what can we say about this text then? Um, I've, I've disabused you of a lot of things. Do no harm is not in it. Nobody seems to have sworn to it. Uh, we don't even think that people were following it. So why is it here? And why did it end up in the Hippocratic writings? Our earliest possible mention of the Hippocratic Oath besides the actual oath may be in one of the readings for this week. This is something Cato the Elder said, and we know about it because Pliny the Elder quotes him. I'm going to talk about this textual issue in another slide. Um, you're going to find this in Pliny the Elder, but it's something Cato the Elder said, is that all Greek doctors have gotten together and sworn amongst themselves that they're going to secretly experiment on their Roman patients and just kill them while pretending to be their doctors. Some scholars have pointed to this and said, oh, Cato is badly misinformed about the Hippocratic Oath. Like he thinks that it's some kind of a sadistic Greek blood oath. That is a theory. I'm not sure I completely buy it. It would be cool if it were, but I feel like I have to throw it out here. So the first actual, legit, provable reference to the Hippocratic Oath outside of the Hippocratic Oath is in the first century CE in an author we're going to read towards the end of the course, Seronus of Ephesus. He's writing about women's health, and in his discussion of contraception and abortion, he mentions this line in the oath where he says, um, Hippocrates, the Hippocratic author, said that you shouldn't give an abortifacient pessary. You shouldn't give one of these suppositories to induce an abortion. And then Seronis goes on to discuss, well, look, there are a couple of ways of interpreting this. Here's what I think about it. In this soundbite, it's very clear that Seronis never swore to uphold this oath. He doesn't consider it binding, but he does consider it important and necessary to discuss. So, 
those of us who are tracking the development of medical ethics in the ancient world think that the first century CE is a moment where Greek speaking physicians begin to reach for this text as a way of building trust between themselves and their patients. And there's a really good reason for that. And it has everything to do with this course, which is why we're talking about this right now. That is, we start to see Greek speaking physicians becoming the standard of care for upper class Roman patients. They begin to prefer Greek educated and Greek speaking doctors. They begin to see Greek style medicine as more effective and more legitimate. But at the same time, Romans are in a cultural context with Greek speakers that is actively hostile. Rome conquered first the Greek mainland and then the entire Near East, and with it, they enslaved large numbers of Greek-speaking people, including a large number of Greek-speaking physicians. These physicians then, as enslaved people, were forced to practice medicine in Roman contexts. Some of them subsequently gained their freedom. Others were freeborn Greek physicians who traveled to Rome because Roman patients had the money and the influence. This was a colonialist world where Greek speaking physicians were at a disadvantage. However, this didn't mean they had no power because doctors know things that other people don't know. And this knowledge is directly related to your range of ways in which you can kill someone. Not just that, but your access to the body means that you have the perfect alibi if you want to kill a Roman, at least to a paranoid Roman mind. And this is what Cato the Elder is saying in, in his um, letter to his son that then Pliny the Elder quotes and elaborates on. So Romans, when they worried about Greek physicians, they, they felt that Greek medicine was too valuable to ignore. However, they were really worried that Greek physicians were taking advantage of their power and their knowledge, and that they did not have Romans' best interests at heart. That because this was an inherently colonialist environment, wherein slavery and domination was implicit in the social context, doctors couldn't be trusted. What this meant for doctors, we're going to get into next week when we talk about Roman law and risk management. This means that doctors were constantly under suspicion and they needed to come up with ways to build trust and um, safe working conditions for themselves when interacting with powerful Roman patients. And here's where the oath comes in. The oath is this document they can point to and they can say, hey, look, look, this is in the Hippocratic Corpus and it says I can't kill you right here. Look, look, I'm not supposed to kill you. This is a good thing. Um, that is where the Hippocratic Oath starts to gain real traction. Now, in late antiquity, as Greek medicine becomes less controversial as Greekness and Romanness becomes less of a dividing line and more of a combined identity for Mediterranean people, then the Hippocratic Oath becomes more um, institutionalized. And eventually, when you get into university contexts in Islam and later Christianity, the Hippocratic Oath becomes a useful way of regulating medical ethics in your student body. And at this point, there's a problem because it's an oath that begins with an invocation of these polytheistic gods, Apollo, Asclepius, Hygieia, Panacea, all of them, neither Jesus, nor God, nor Allah, nor Hashem, uh, for monotheism, this is a problem. And that's why I've given you this image here. This is from a late antique manuscript in Greek, where the text of the Hippocratic Oath has been written in the shape of a cross in order to make it look more okay for a Christian going to get medical education. This is the point where the Hippocratic Oath becomes an actual oath that people are taking long after the period where this course ends. So there you go. If you ever want to be really annoying and pedantic to somebody, bring this up. Or not. Now on to 
that influential idea that I teased in the first slide, we need to talk about the four humors. This is the idea that emerges triumphant out of the different theories that Hippocratic physicians are kicking around in the 4th and 5th centuries BCE. By the time we get into the Roman period, most Greek physicians are referring to this set of four humors. Um, now, they're not necessarily believing in them. This is still a controversial idea, and I'll get into the specifics moving ahead. But first, I have to explain the idea. So here is the theory. One of many theories that are going to be used in the Roman period to explain how the body works. This theory takes its cue from a movement in natural philosophy that posited all matter in the universe is made up of four essential elements, four different kinds of matter. And these four elements are earth, air, fire, and water. Um, this is a separate theory from the theory of atoms, which is another ancient theory that's going to inform another theory of the human body. In this model, then, early doctors are like, okay, so if we buy the four element model, and not all Greek physicians did, or natural philosophers. Some natural philosophers thought that everything was water, just in different forms of water. Some people thought that everything was air, just more dense or less dense or really, really dense. And they're all kind of right in a way, aren't they? It's, it's sort of interesting. But those who went for a four element model said, okay, if there are four elements in nature, these four elements have to express themselves in the human body. If you look at human bodies, there are a few substances that you find in every body, substances that are really important for keeping that body functional. Uh, only inside the body, they're liquidy because they have to congeal into this human form. The theory was then that Water inside the human body manifests as the humor called phlegm. In fact, we still talk about phlegm. Phlegm is still a thing. You, you've probably met some of it because we're in allergy season. And that, that phlegm, you know, the stuff you're coughing up and drooling out of your nose, that, that's phlegm. For Hipp Hippocratic physicians and eventually Galen, this is one that makes the list every single time because it's a really obvious liquid that comes out of the body. And it's also a really important one. If the body lacks enough moisture, the body dies. If you don't drink, you die. The, this one's a pretty obvious one. And it's also one that lends itself toward diagnoses of health or illness because a body that is sick produces phlegm in a different way than a body that is well. And by this logic, then, if you can manipulate the amount of phlegm within the body, so the theory goes, you can treat the imbalance that's causing the disease and return the body to its ideal state. And the ideal state resides right here in the middle of this diagram. I'm going to draw on this a little bit. So where the red scribble is. The idea here is that you want the human body to have the ideal mixture or balance of the four humors, which means that the ideal amount of each element is in the body in the location where it's supposed to be. So you want just enough phlegm, not too much. And you can tell whether there's too much or too little phlegm in areas where phlegm isn't obvious, right? Like you know, your mouth, you can find the phlegm easily. But if you're trying to figure out, say, if like your hand has enough phlegm in the, the flesh of your, your palm, then you want to look for what they call the qualities, the things by which you recognize phlegm's phlegminess. And it's the same things that makes water water. Water is cold and water is moist. Sorry, we're going to say the word moist a lot in this class. So if a part of the body is cold and it's moist. So the idea goes, there's some phlegm hanging out in there. And if it's not cold and moist enough, it needs more phlegm. If it's too cold and moist, it needs less phlegm. And you can adjust phlegm by adjusting the conditions around the body. Certain foods were thought to be drying, certain foods were thought to be cooling or moistening. And 
some of this is going to yield therapeutic results. If you are dehydrated and you drink water, you are going to feel better. And that is not an insignificant advance in medical treatment. And a lot of the signs that you look for when you're looking for coldness and moistness are signs that are going to tell you whether or not dehydration is present. Not everything about this is silly. So the next body fluid that everybody could agree existed in the human body was blood. A little bit more controversial was figuring out what element blood goes with, but most people agree that blood in the body is like air outside because blood is hot. It's warm, unlike phlegm, which is kind of cold, especially if you're sneezing. And it's moist, like if you've met blood, you know it, it's wet stamp flows. Air, at least in the Mediterranean, tends to be kind of hot and kind of moist. It's uh, maybe not so much in North Africa, but it's a fairly humid, warm kind of place. And they also noticed that blood had something to do with breathing. Like they weren't quite sure what, because circulation wasn't a theory they had access to. But they did begin to have this idea that we we have to breathe for a reason, right? Breathing is weird. You have to do it or you die. And if you stop doing it for a very short time, you're going to experience some very unpleasant effects. Yes, uh, humans figured out how to strangle each other very early on. So ancient doctors would realize air is important. Blood is also important. If there's not blood in your body, you're going to experience rapid death in a way that looks a little bit like what happens if you don't get air. So this idea that blood has something to do with air is not wrong. It's not right in the way they think it's right, but it is an observation that has some validity to it. Now, because blood is the hot, moist humor, and we're looking for bodily fluids that give us suggestions for clinical interventions. Here is where things go off the rails a little bit, because they felt if your body was too hot and too moist, like if you had a flop sweaty fever, as you tend to do in the Mediterranean, because it's a malarial endemic zone. So the thought went, you, you just have too much blood. You need to drain some of that blood out. Now, radical bleeding treatments aren't really a thing in ancient medicine. The amounts taken out are, are pretty moderate and mild in the ancient world. Radical bleeding is more of a 16, 1700s thing. But even still, there is, uh, to be clear, very little therapeutic effect with bleeding. Now there is some, it can be may be helpful with some kinds of malarial infections, but please don't bleed your malarial friends. We can do better now. If you have certain metabolic disorders that affect your body's ability to flush iron, bleeding can treat you from having a toxic buildup of iron that can destroy your bone tissue and cause other very unpleasant and painful effects. So if you happen to have hemochromatosis, then bleeding will help. That's where it ends, unfortunately. I, I can't rescue bleeding. It's a horrible idea. More so in an era before germ theory and the ability to make sure that cuts in the skin are made in a sterile and hygienic fashion. I can't rescue this one, folks. But I just want to push back on the idea that it's completely irrational either. It's an idea that leads us to really productive places in another mm, thousand years or so, um, even before Harvey, even Sinna is beginning to zero in on how respiration connects to blood and how blood carries something from air that's important. Uh, so Harvey gets all the credit for this, but we should really pat even Sinna on the back too. All right, on to fire and earth. These were the harder ones that there were a lot more debates about, but by the time we get to Galen, this is what they agree on. Fire is the less controversial one. They believed that the element fire was represented in the body by a substance called yellow bile. Uh, the word for it in Latin, or sorry, Greek is uh, choler, 
uh, C-H-O-L-E-R. We still say choleric sometimes when we're talking about somebody who's got a real hot temper. In the Renaissance, this got used as a personality theory as well as um, a medical theory that, you know, if you have too much yellow bile, you're going to have temper problems and anger management issues. Yellow bile is the substance secreted through your gallbladder. It's a digestive fluid that your body squirts into the very upper part of your small intestine right near the stomach. If you've ever been very, very sick to the point where you're throwing up a lot and you get this kind of yellowy, greeny, oily, acidic gunk coming up. I'm so sorry, guys. This is going to be that kind of a class. You should know this at the outset. It's going to get gross. That is yellow bile. Congratulations, you've met yellow bile. And you've also met the reason why yellow bile became a suspect body fluid for these early doctors because this is a fluid that comes out of you when you are violently ill. You tend to be running a very high fever. The fluid itself burns the flesh of your mucous membranes coming up, so it feels like fire in your body. And the bile of animals can be used with caustic effect in various remedies too. So this association with fire and the acidity of digestive fluids, including yellow bile, tracks. It makes sense. And much like fire, this is felt to be the hot, dry thing. This is the thing that gives you fevers that don't make you sweat, that run very, very dangerously high and don't break at safe levels. Um, the idea that this is a, a humor that comes on acutely and causes extreme illness that's very dangerous very quickly attracts, really. A, a lot of illnesses do manifest this way, including um, food poisoning, which can be fatal in ancient contexts, also gallbladder disease, um, peptic ulcer. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why you're going to be barfing up yellow bile. Some of them easily recoverable, some of them very, very dangerous. So this logic suggested therapeutically that if you're seeing a lot of yellow bile, you want to get rid of as much of it as possible. So they try to make you throw up more. They figure that your body's doing this throwing up thing for a reason, so they try to encourage it a bit, which can sometimes work. And sometimes it dehydrates you, which they realized, because they thought of this as the opposite of water. It's why things are arranged here. Water is the opposite of fire. Water puts out fire. Fire burns away water. So if you have too much fire in your body in the form of yellow bile, it's going to dehydrate you. So in order to deal with the yellow bile, you want to get rid of the yellow bile and replace it with more phlegm by upping your, your water intake. That's not unreasonable. It's not a horrible idea, actually. Uh, better than bleeding. So on to our most controversial and debated humor. This is the one that's connected to Earth, and it's called black bile. You've probably heard words that derive from it. Its Greek name is melaina chole, or sorry, uh, melaina chole. Melaina gives us melanin. It means dark or deep brownie black, this kind of coffee ground color. This is going to be important in a minute. Uh, holer is the same word we used for yellow bile. This is just bile that happens to be black. What is black bile? You may ask yourself, and what does it have to do with coffee grounds? Glad you didn't ask. When you bleed into your digestive tract, the digestive juices in your intestines cause that bloody material, and uh, your stomach acid will do this too, they cause the blood to oxidize. So the red, the iron that makes up the red corpuscles turns deep, rusty, brown, black, and it curdles, um, it clots. The acid speeds up the clotting process and it turns into this substance that looks like crumbly, loamy soil or coffee grounds is what we call it today. Uh, one of the signs you look out for in dangerous illnesses, uh, it's a sign that you're bleeding into your gut if you're either pooping or vomiting up a coffee ground like substance. If you're vomiting it up, you probably have a bleeding ulcer in your stomach or you have a bleed in your esophagus. Esophagus, um, probably your stomach though. Uh, you can also, in extreme illness, uh, barf up 
intestinal juices too, which is lovely. I don't recommend it. It's really unpleasant. You can also poop it out the other end and it'll look you know, like loamy earth. Greeks didn't have coffee. It's a new world product, so they didn't call it coffee ground. Instead, they were like, oh, this looks like dirt. And it tends to leak out of the body when things are going really badly. They thought that some of them felt that this black bile only shows up in disease states, that there's no healthy amount of black bile the body can tolerate. Others say, oh, no, 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 no. In a healthy body, the black bile is the solid part of the body, that it's not meant to be flowing out of you. It's the stuff that makes up the hard bits of your body, the firmness of flesh, the hardness of bone, the hardness of teeth, that when mixed with other humors, it forms the structural elements of the body's rigid bits. And that what we see when it's leaking out of the body is that the body has become so unbalanced that the humors begin to erode away the structural foundation of the body. And so your solid bits are kind of leaking out, which is not exactly what's going on, but they're right that it's very, very bad and very difficult to treat in an ancient patient too. So like earth, this was felt to be dry and cold. And clinically, if your patient is dry and cold, they're probably not doing very well, yes? Because your body temperature drops when you are in the process of going into shock and dying. Um, it's a sign that you can feel on a patient. It's one of the things that you use in physical examination when you're trying to assess uh, how badly someone needs to be moved up the triage line. Uh, dryness too is a sign that a disease is reaching a spinal stages. Uh, often in disease processes, you've dehydrated yourself badly. And this is a world without hypodermic needles. You can't give someone IV fluids in the ancient world. We'll, we'll talk about other ways you can get fluids into people who are vomiting and having extreme diarrhea. But for the most part, it is very difficult to rehydrate a patient in pre-modern medicine, and that informs this idea of black bile. So all of this comes together to suggest a nexus between theory, this theory about what makes up the human body, and clinical practice. So it's both an idea about the body, but also an idea that suggests ways to diagnose and treat illnesses, which is why this is such a popular chestnut. It makes intuitive sense. It gives you some logical advice to follow when treating a patient. It coheres with general features of clinical disease and it gets you something to do in a low-tech context. Now, I'm not saying that this is a legit way to treat the human body. This has been very well debunked. This is an old theory we've improved on. But I want us to pause here for a minute to give it some respect because this was a really necessary step that we needed to take to get us to where we are. And other cultures come up with different versions of this that get them to a similar place. This is the beginning of observing what are the fluids in the human body? Where do they come from? Where should they be? Where should they not be? How do you touch a body, look at a body, smell a body, taste a body to figure out whether it's a healthy body or a sick body? This is all really important work. And this gave people an intellectual framework to use as they were trying to organize knowledge that they were getting from day-to-day -day clinical practice and first-line medical research. So let's take a minute. Good job, Hippocratic humoralists. Now let's talk about the religious world of the Greek East. This is going to inform a lot of what's going on in the religion that's medicine adjacent in the Roman world, too. 
there are several gods who are associated with healing in Greco-Roman religion, but the one dedicated god to healing was a hero god named Asclepius, and I've given you a couple spellings of his name. Asclepius or Asclepius are two ways of spelling his Greek name. Osculapius or Isculapius is how Romans pronounced his name. It's the same guy. You know you're looking at him because he'll be this uh, bearded dude with a walking stick that has a single snake crawling up it. One snake, not two. More about that in a minute. Now I say hero god because his backstory is that he was the son of Apollo and one of Apollo's girlfriends. And Apollo, uh, Apollo, don't date Apollo, is my first bit of advice here. She was pregnant by Apollo and then had a mortal boyfriend she was also having sex with, Apollo found out, got mad, killed her, and then was like, oh shit, she's pregnant. So he cut her body open and performed a C-section to rescue the baby who became Asclepius. Uh, side note, C-sections could be done in the ancient world, but they were not survivable by the parent. Um, if you cut a baby out of somebody's body in the ancient world, they're going to die. It was used as a last ditch attempt to try to rescue the baby if the mother was dead or in the process of dying. It was more common to try to save the mother's life than to rescue the child. I'm not going to get into that too much here. I just felt like it's important to point this out because sometimes you'll see popular sources that'll say, oh yes, Romans did C-sections, and then they won't mention the very important detail that the mother doesn't live. It's important, you know. Okay, so Asclepius, while he was alive and uh, lived as a human being, was a doctor, but because he was a demigod, he was a really good doctor. So good, in fact, that he got into trouble with Hades, the god of the underworld, because he wasn't just saving people from dying, but rather he was resurrecting people and Hades was getting super cheesed off because, okay, it's tough to be Hades. He has to live underground all the time. He doesn't get out much. He has to constantly be playing like hall monitor for a bunch of dead people's shades. It's kind of frustrating work. His wife's gone half the year. It's just him and his dog. His dog's adorable. It's got three heads. So it's kind of like three dogs, but even three dogs isn't enough to make that okay. So like the one perk he gets out of this, well, all the gemstones but also he gets to keep the souls of mortals and they should stay put that's like his job and also his thing and if you can take souls out of the underworld you are messing with hades turf so hades struck asclepius dead but hades is one of the least jerky of the uh, greco-roman gods hades allowed demigods uh, or even particularly effective mortals to have a divine presence in, in the world above. Not all gods, uh, ancient Greeks and Romans thought, lived above the underworld in the sky. They also believed that there were gods who were based out of the underworld whom you could pray to for intervention, and one of these is Asclepius. So Asclepius became the god of healing in his own right, and he really got to be a major figure around the late 5th, 4th century BCE, probably in the wake of a pandemic that hit Athens in 430. We still don't know what the pathogen was for that one, by the way. We're, we're working on it, but we don't know. But if you're interested, they call it the Plague of Athens or the Plague of 430. It might have been a hemorrhagic fever, which is kind of nifty. Um, but beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. Okay. So here is how you go about worshiping Asclepius. Before we do that, though, we need to talk about one of his major helpers. It's a family business. Asclepius, his two sons, and his two daughters all collaborated as part of this mini pantheon of healing and health care. I'm going to introduce you to just one of them in this next slide. Oh, right. Uh, we also need to talk about the awkward matter of the caduceus of hermes versus the rod of asclepius these may look like very similar symbols they're very different in greco-roman religion the one on the right this here 
with the large rod with the one snake, that's the healing one. That's the Asclepius rod. That is the one that keeps sick people from going to the underworld. Awkwardly and confusingly, this one here that I'm about to outline in blue, right there, that is the Caduceus of Hermes. Now, it may look like snakes on a stick, but this is a very different snake on a stick thing. There are two snakes on a stick that has wings on it because Hermes has like wings. And this is the staff that Hermes uses to lead the souls of the recently dead from the world of the living to the house of Hades. This is the stick that takes you from being alive to being dead. In other words, this is the death stick. So, the one on the red, one snake, no death. Two snakes, yes, death. And this is super awkward because a lot of medical associations get the wrong snake stick. <clears throat> American Medical Association. EMS, though, good job. And dentists, dentists get this right. So if you're going into EMS or dentistry, you can feel very smug about yourself. Okay. On to... Oh, I don't have a picture of Hygieia. Well, that's sad. Um, Asclepius' daughter Hygieia is the goddess of preventative medicine, and I bring her up because her name gives us the word hygiene for preventative medicine via washing your hands and wearing masks and staying home if you can. Hi, Hygieia. Now, you would worship Asclepius in a couple of ways. One of them was you would come to one of his temples, either the main one as an Epidaurus, if you want to know, but they were branch offices in pretty much every Greek speaking city of the Mediterranean. And eventually just every city in the Mediterranean had one of these. And you would go there to either buy or bring a model of the body part that you wanted Asclepius to intervene for. On the left, I'm going to use my blue marker again, we have one such votive offering or votive plaque. This is carved out of marble. This is a fancy one. And it says in Greek, for those of you who read Greek, so starting here at the top of the A, that's an alpha and a sigma. So it says Ascle P-O to Asclepius, Chi is the Greek word for and, so to Asclepius and Hygieia, Hygieia, so to Asclepius and his daughter Hygieia, the goddess of health. Um, Tuche means either the goddess of luck or might be the patient's name is Tuche, it's an ancient Greek name, it means lucky. Elcharisterion means a thank offering. So this basically says, um, for Asclepius and Hygieia, Tuche gives this thank you gift, this thank you note. So if you were healed, you would give one of these to the sanctuary and they'd display it as a testimonial saying, hey, look, Asclepius healed this leg. But you would also bring these offerings as part of your prayer for health ahead of time too. And that's what we've got going on on the right here with the, the red circle around it. This I quite love because it's a votive plaque. So there's the thank you art plaque showing the patient coming to the sanctuary and bringing his model leg. And you'll notice that he's putting it on a pedestal in a row of feet and legs. This seems to have been a thing. You'd bring your offering to the section of the temple where people put your body part and there'd just be this whole stack of body parts hanging out in different parts of the temple. This particular leg, if you look at the carving, there's a little wiggly line at the side of the leg right here. That's a varicose vein. Likely this patient was praying to have a varicose vein heal. And in their thank you offering, they show themselves bringing the leg to the temple in the art as a way of saying, look, I brought a leg and I got a leg. So this is a big part of the, the worship ritual is you bring a model of the body part, and if Asclepius heals you, then you have to bring a nicer model of the body part. Asclepius just loves body parts in a not creepy way. It's actually quite creepy. The other way that you would access a cure at a temple of Asclepius is a little bit more involved. It's a process called incubation. This doesn't mean sitting on an egg. 
rather it means sleeping overnight either in the temple or in the sacred precinct around the temple. To illustrate what I mean by this, here we're looking at the floor plan of one such temple to Asclepius. This one is in Lerna, if I remember correctly. So the archaeological site has a small temple on the inside. Greek and later Roman religious sites included a temple, and then there would be a wall around the edge of the temple, which I'm outlining here. The, the big red line is the Temenos wall. That tells you where the sacred ground is and where the line is between sacred ground and normal ground. Once you're inside that wall, you have to behave in a certain way. For instance, you're not allowed to murder anyone inside the temple grounds. So spilling human blood, very bad. You're not supposed to give birth there, which becomes awkward for some of Asclepius' patients. Uh, a lot of the patients and their stories about how this worked out were like, I prayed to give birth and I had to waddle outside of the wall really quick to give birth. Uh, them's the rules. You're also not supposed to dirty the area, litter there. You're not supposed to have dead bodies in the area. This is where temples of Asclepius were a little different because in many temples, sick people aren't allowed to be there. In fact, not just sick people, but also people with disabilities. If you had a limb difference, there were some temples, in fact, many temples where you weren't allowed to sacrifice to the gods because people with limb differences were considered uh, inappropriate for a place of the gods. The gods only wanted perfect whole bodies, which is super ableist. Interestingly, there were some ancient people who protested this, including this uh, one badass war veteran in ancient Rome who had uh, lost both of his hands in different battles and been wounded like 20 times. And uh, when he was praetor, he had this prosthetic hand and he wanted to go offer sacrifices. And his colleagues were like, nah, brah, you know, you've got to have all your arms to sacrifice to the gods. And he's like, look, with my one prosthetic hand, I've killed more enemies of Rome than you guys have with your two hands, so I think I have enough body to sacrifice to the gods. There. Jerks. He... Wish I could remember his name off the top of my head. It's kind of messing with ex this example, isn't it? In the Temple of Asclepius, this wasn't the case. This was a place where sick people were invited inside the sacred precinct, sometimes inside the temple, but mostly just inside the wall area. And there were these purpose-built enclosures where you would sleep overnight and the sacred animals would come and touch you while you were sleeping there. The animals sacred to Asclepius are dogs and snakes. The dogs would lick you and the snakes would crawl all over you. And while you dreamed, if, if you could sleep with puppies licking you and snakes crawling all over you, um, it, it seems that people were drugged. I think that would help if you want to go sleep in a snake pit. I love snacks. I do. But I don't know. The puppies might be nicer. So while you dreamed, the idea was that the god would come to you in your dream and would give you a miraculous cure or would suggest for you a way that you could cure yourself when you woke up. We think there may have been physicians practicing as part of the temple priests. There's some evidence that there was a little bit of overlap between medical practice and medical training and this religious context. Certainly doctors didn't see this as competition. I mean, some raised their brows at it a little bit, but most doctors would routinely go to the local temple of Asclepius to make an offering at the beginning of their career or after a particularly good cure to give thanks to the god because it was seen as important for doctors to show that they were upstanding members of the community and this meant honoring the gods. Now some doctors were more religiously observant than others. Just like today, people are people. People have different responses to their religious environment, but it would be wrong to look at Asclepius as in competition with uh, rationalizing medical practice. Rather, the two seem to have coexisted pretty comfortably. Now, I bring all this up because at a certain point, in the city of Rome, and this was a regular thing for Rome, whenever they were in crisis, especially pandemic crisis, and this happened pretty regularly because Rome supported a large population with 
poor sanitation. It was in a malarial basin on swampy land with a poorly draining river through the middle of it. And people were coming from all over the Mediterranean in larger and larger numbers as we get closer to the first centuries CE. This means you have the perfect storm for disease outbreaks and pandemics. Diseases rip through Rome on a regular basis. They're a couple of decade. So in this one particular instance, the priests hoods, hoods of Rome and the Senate asked the gods, OK, what can we do to resolve this particular epidemic? And the answer was, OK, you need to get one of the sacred snakes from the mother temple of Asclepius at Epidaurus and bring it to Rome. So they sent a boat, got a snake, brought the boat up the river Tiber. And then, according to legend, the boat stuck in the Tiber, rooted and became an island. You're looking at the island. This is Tiber Island. This, however, is not the temple to Asclepius that was torn down. There's a Renaissance palace built on top of it. That's what you're looking at is the Renaissance palace. Uh, but what this means for the period in Roman history we're going to be dealing with is that one of the major shrines in the city of Rome was dedicated to Osculapius or Aesculapius, their version of Asclepius. And it was on this island in the middle of Tiber, allowing them to separate the sick from the well a little bit. Now, this all sounds really nice and uh, pro-social, but I'm... Uh, I'm so sorry, this is about to get super depressing and not for the first time. The ancient Mediterranean was a slave owning society. Ancient Rome was a particularly high volume slave owning society and enslaved people who were sick or injured or too old to work were routinely dumped at the temple of Aesculapius on Tiber Island to die so that the people who had enslaved them and profited from their labor didn't have to take care of them in their old age. Now, this was considered tacky, but it was happening a lot. And this, th th there is some good news here. One of the first moves to regulate human rights for enslaved people ever comes in the reign of the Emperor Claudius who made it so that if you abandon an enslaved person on Tiber Island and that person subsequently recovers, you cannot come back and claim that person as your slave, nor can you claim them as your patron. That'll make more sense later in the course. In other words, by abandoning them on Tiber Island, you are freeing them. Now, Possibly some of what Claudius was trying to do was trying to solve the very real human rights problem posed by abandoning sick slaves. Uh, just because Romans are doing it a lot doesn't mean some Romans didn't see a problem with that. Uh, part of what gives me hope sometimes when I'm tackling slavery in ancient context is that it's not just modern people looking at Romans going, oh my God, that's so bad. Ancient Romans are already starting to say, this doesn't seem right. Sometimes the same people who are also trafficking human beings, like the bar is very low and hypocrisy is rife. Is hypocrisy, it's still rife, right? It's one thing to admit something is unethical and another thing to refuse to do it. The economic realities of our world make us do things we find unethical more than I'd like to admit. Maybe you're better at that than I am, but... The... The less happy interpretation of what Claudius was trying to do here may be that the temple was no longer able to deal with the glut of sick and abandoned old people they found themselves in possession of. Uh, they just couldn't handle it, and there needed to be some kind of disincentive to keep people from abandoning their most vulnerable trafficked people. So. Um, yeah, sorry, that went to a depressing place again. But 
that's an important thing to confront early and often. That's going to be with us as we take our journey through the world of Roman doctors and Roman healers. Enslaved people are going to be physicians and patients, and it's something that you're going to have to keep in your mind as you think about how the text we read would apply to you if you were one of these enslaved people in the ancient world. Per capita, you or someone related to you would be statistically more likely to be adjacent to enslavement, if not enslaved themselves, than they would be likely to, say, hang out with Pliny the Elder or go catch lunch with Cato. So how did Greek medicine get to be a thing in Rome? For this, we need to do some real quick political history. The Hellenistic period is the period after Alexander the Great's conquest of what used to be the Persian Empire. This results in several kingdoms run by Greek-speaking people who themselves identified as Greek. Sometimes people say, oh, they're not really Greek, they're Macedonian. This is... Um, not, not a meaningful category for reasons I can't get into in the minute. Um, these people identified as Greek. They called themselves Greek. They spoke Greek. They worshipped Greek gods. They're Greek. Okay. If you say you're Greek, you're Greek. And within this context, they created courts that were able to attract and maintain medical talent and also support medical research, which leads to advances and debates in medical history that inform the kind of medicine that Rome inherits. But also this creates a situation in which there are these consolidated chunks of the Eastern Mediterranean that as Rome begins to expand into this area, Rome begins to gobble up by a process of slow encroachment, of allyship leading to um, indirect control, leading to hegemony, leading to direct colonialist control. With these wars of conquest and various diplomatic moves, Rome actively traffics people who are prisoners of war, who are sold to them uh, through a secondary trafficker market. This is how a lot of Greek speakers end up in the Roman workforce, such as it is, through this process of prisoner of war and then enslaved professional and later freed person. But they're also upper class hostages who have a professional career in Rome, living their entire lives as hostages whose safety is dependent on how their well-connected relatives at home behave with respect to Rome. This is not a great environment for engendering trust, no? But it's not just enslaved Greeks who are part of the Roman medical landscape because as Romans begin to move into this world, they are also moving into a diplomatic reality that confronts them with a choice, either to double down on their local systems of medicine. This involves folk healing and a system for providing health care that relies on the male head of household, um, a person we call the pater familias. We'll talk about him more in week two. To know about health care and to provision for the treatment of people under his care and control. Traditionally, this seems to have been part of your upper class Roman education, is there would be some medical knowledge and you would be expected to keep a garden and be involved with the people that you uh, control and or own. This includes family members and enslaved people. Now, as contact is made with the Greek East, there's an acknowledgement that treatment modalities exist that don't exist in Italian traditional medicine, and that information sources in the written record are a valuable part of learning about human anatomy and medical treatment. Similarly, there's this perception among the public that the sophistication of 
theory that you get in the Greek tradition, this medicine rooted in philosophy that makes it difficult to practice medicine unless you are upper class enough to have this specific kind of education. Romans enter into this world where they're like, they um, are led to believe for reasons both good and also not so great that Greek medicine as it's practiced in the Greek speaking tradition has more options, has better treatments, has more effective treatments, and therefore has to be entered into. But your average upper class Roman guy doesn't have time to learn how to be a medical doctor in the Greek speaking tradition. You have to dedicate a significant amount of your time to getting up on the medical literature and training to do these procedures. Upper class Roman men also are not supposed to touch blood and guts a lot. They're not supposed to taste vomit or urine. That's considered undignified and icky. Uh, there isn't this perception among upper class Greek people so much. Uh, medicine for them is considered to be an appropriate career path for an elite person. And I use person deliberately here. Uh, women were doctors, men were doctors, non-binary people were doctors, I'm sure. Similarly, in Rome, we get a, a spread. So um, women were in medicine a lot in pretty much every culture, at least in the Mediterranean. I can say that with some authority. This situation is going to inform your first readings for this week, where you're going to meet two different Romans reacting to a medical marketplace in which they have to contend with a knowledge gap between Greek style physicians and Roman patients. And they have to make choices in light of that about their family's safety in the hands of medical professionals. So here we go. Let's meet our authors. Um, the, the pictures aren't quite well arrayed here, so I'll um, draw arrows a bit. So this isn't actually Cato the Elder. This is a portrait bust that you'll sometimes see identified with Cato the Elder. This isn't him. This is an unidentified Roman portrait of about the time Cato the Elder lived, between 234 and 149 BCE. But you can, if you've read Cato the Elder, you can kind of see why. Uh, he gives off this very grumpy vibe, and some of that has to do with the topic that his surviving work is written on. Now, you're reading an excerpt from his De Agricultura. This is a poem teaching you how to run a farm. Now, notice I say run a farm. This isn't how to, with your own hands holding the plow, run a farm. This is how to manage a plantation that is being run by enslaved people. Big difference, yes. Uh, this is farming in the same way that, say, Thomas Jefferson is farming. So, uh, Cato the Elder was a politician and statesman who is most famous for advocating heavily that Rome go to war a third time with Carthage and utterly destroy it, which Rome does indeed end up doing. He was also a great advocate for Latin language over Greek language. He was very much into this idea that it's inappropriate for Romans to speak Greek and read Greek and dabble in Greek language literature. That and this is an interesting stance because he himself studied in Athens for a while. He, in effect, went to college in Greece to learn Greek. So it's not that he didn't speak Greek, but rather he believed that, you know, look, you need to know enough about Greek literature that you know what they're up to. But Romans, you, you don't need to speak Greek. Latin is awesome. You should speak Latin and you should not try to be Greek. You should be proud of being Roman. Uh, it's this very um, Rome first philosophy that's actively hostile in a, a method or a mode we call xenophobia. That is a fear of people who are foreign. And for Cato, this isn't just about Greeks, although this is one um, ethno-racial group that Cato is super against. Uh, but you know, don't think he just singles out Greeks. He hates Carthaginians too. 
and also women, um, bless his heart. Yeah, the reason why we're reading him, however, is because he's quite early. You'll notice he's our first Roman author, and he is representing this phase of Roman medicine that's as close as we can get to what Roman medicine may have looked like before Greek ideas and scientific principles became highly influential. However, one makes a mistake when looking at Cato as some kind of pure Roman medicine. It's not that. Some of the substances he names in his recipes for cures are imported. Some of them are from Pontus on the Black Sea. Some of them are Greek sourced wines and olive oils. So it's still a medicine that's not just exclusively using Italian products. It's using all kinds of imported products. Some of the recipes are very similar to the sorts of things we see in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, this likely indicates more continuity than difference between traditional Italian medicine and traditional medicine elsewhere in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has no vacuums. Everyone's in contact with everybody else. But what does make Cato interesting is that he doesn't quote Greek authorities too much. I think he mentions Pythagoras once, and this is one that Romans give a pass to because Pythagoras was active in southern Italy, so he kind of he gets a little bit of a pass. He's less Greek than the other Greeks for some Romans. In general, though, his cures don't look entirely like the kinds of things we see coming out of the Hippocratic corpus. For instance, there are phrases that you say as you're applying treatments. These phrases can't be translated. They're essentially nonsense words in Latin. They're the equivalent of abracadabra. Fun fact, abracadabra is an ancient Roman incantation that you would say as part of a ritual to prevent malaria the more you know. So that's a, that's a Roman thing, abracadabra. He also really loves cabbage, uh, hence the Cato and Cabbage fan art that I've provided for you, and I don't want to spoil that experience. Um, another thing about Cato the Elder that I find really super entertaining is that we have very good evidence that at some point in time he did put a stick up his butt. Uh, one of the cures he recommends for thigh chafing, for chub rub, is that if you take a stick of wormwood from Pontus and you put it up your bum, you will prevent thigh chafing. I suppose because you're walking funny. I have questions. Okay. So that's what you need to know about Cato the Elder. He is very reactionary, and he's from this very early period of Roman history. But he also is a very famous politician. Well after his death, he becomes this rallying figure for Romans who are really into Rome first, Romans speak Latin, uh, Romans shouldn't be bossed around by Greeks, uh, this whole movement of uh, Rome first and making Rome great again, dare I say, is the Cato brand. Which brings me to our next author. Well over a century later, actually this is two centuries later, what am I saying? Pliny the Elder. Now, Pliny the Elder quotes Cato and he does have some unfortunate viewpoints, but you'll have to forgive me. I'm a bit of a super fan for this guy. Pliny the Elder is kind of my ancient best friend. I pretend to be him on Twitter is my hobby, in case you are interested. Um, Pliny the Elder is just so cool. Uh, problematic. Very, very problematic. Ancient people kind of are. But, oh gosh, uh, just let me fangirl for a minute here. So he's born in 23 CE, so this is well after Cato's time, and he's from an upper class family, but not senatorial class. So he's not quite a one percenter, but he's very close to power centers. His family is wealthy, and he ends up working eventually on the staff of various emperors in imperial project management, but he begins in the military as a cavalry and naval officer. One of his earliest campaigns is in northern 
Germany, um, the Netherlands, thereabouts, in a war against the Chati. At this point, though, he he becomes really interested in reading and writing science, all kinds of science. He was incredibly geeky, and he did everything he could to use his spare time to study. So while he's on military campaigns, he'd have one of his staffers reading to him, kind of like a book on tape. And eventually, as he became more highly placed, uh, he, and here's where it gets unfortunate again, he had an enslaved secretarial pool who would read to him during all of his spare hours. He'd travel from meeting to meeting, carried around on a couch so he didn't have to stop reading so that he could like read between meetings. He was that person. And I, not, I don't relate to the slavery part, but I never go anywhere without my Kindle, so I, I kind of get him on this one. But apparently, like, even in the bath, he'd have somebody reading to him, and he'd just, like, duck under the water really quick so he wouldn't have to miss too much of his reading time. At the same time, he'd have another enslaved secretary whom he'd be dictating to, and this is how he wrote all of his stuff. A tiny fra fra uh, fragment of everything he wrote during his lifetime survives. And that is the natural history. Now, I say a tiny fragment, but it's huge. This is a 37 volume, uh, sometimes you'll hear it called an encyclopedia, but that's not quite it. It's a 37 volume work that's meant to be a survey of the state of knowledge in the natural sciences as of the date of Pliny the Elder's lifetime. And it is amazing this thing it is fantastic he starts with a history of the cosmos and the universe and astronomy and he goes into geography and um the human as animal anthropology then animal facts then fish facts uh how to farm how wine works different plants and then book after book after book of medical recipes and then he talks about art history and mineralogy and dance history. And he finally finishes up with gems and uh, mining. Apparently one of the many things he did for the emperor was he was a mine inspector for a while. And within these books, there's a unified theme that divine nature is a goddess worthy of respect and admiration, but she doesn't get respect, that we do harm to the earth as human beings, and that human impact on landscapes, on resources, not only harm other human beings, that it wastes human lives on unnecessary expenditures, but that it also ruins the environment, that it ruins forest scapes, it causes erosion, it pollutes the seas. Pliny is one of the world's first environmental activists and ecologists, which is super, super nifty. But he's also really into human rights, which is going to sound weird because I was just talking about his history as an enslaver and an owner of human beings and also a trafficker because he's an upper class Roman. That's what they do. Um, however, within his natural history, he spends time talking about how farming practices not only harm the land, but also make people unhealthy. How uh, sending people to dive for oysters cost human lives and for what? So that we can wear pearls. He says, like, this is messed up, that we waste human lives on mining operations just to have pretty stuff to wear. He's talking about the need for human rights and the protection of workers in uh, high risk working situations. And it's more interesting because these were jobs that tended to be held by very vulnerable people in the ancient world. Convicts would work mines, also enslaved people who were also, also convict. Uh, he's advocating for not killing people so much with mine labor. Uh, in context, that's pretty darn nifty. And I say all of this before I go into the thing I'm having you read this week, which is not a happy fluffy read at all. This is a section from book 29, which is right in the middle of Pliny telling us about medicine and how to make remedies. And it's part of a larger conversation about how to use 
medical education and knowledge to be an intelligent consumer and also how to protect buyers on the market from being taken advantage of by doctors who overprice things, by disreputable therapies that prey upon the sick and the vulnerable. So he's still in this for consumer protection. Unfortunately, he goes to a place with it because his target is the um, Greek medical industry, uh, Greek physicians, and he has all kinds of ideas about why Greek physicians are shady. I won't spoil them for you. You can read about them yourself. But it's really telling that Ian, he's more than 200 years after Cato the Elder, but the first authority he goes to, to quote, to tell you why you should be really suspicious of Greek physicians is Cato the Elder. And in fact, he quotes Cato the Elder that we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, he stops his own discussion to say, okay, here is a quotation from one of Cato the Elder's letters to his son, and this explains everything I'm talking about. And then he quotes the letter, and then he goes back to his discussion. So this can be a little bit confusing, because yet the author is Pliny the Elder, but he's quoting Cato the Elder, so they're both in the same reading. But just keep in mind, Cato the Elder is older, Pliny the Elder is younger, Pliny quotes Cato in just the same way that um, oh, a modern president might quote George Washington. It's that same appeal to revered authority. But it's also an interesting move on Pliny's part because he's writing about medicine himself and he is a Roman and he strongly identifies as Roman. Like Pliny is very interested in telling you just how Roman a Romany Roman he is. And by his own um, account here, you might be tempted to say like, well, Pliny, you say that anybody from Rome who studies to be a Greek physician immediately loses their Roman cred and like defects to the Greeks. So Pliny, have you gone Greek? So some of what he's doing is a little bit of defensive posturing, but there's also an element of um, outreach here where he's trying to find a way around this prejudice against upper class Romans taking an interest in the nitty gritty details of how Greek medicine is practiced. And it's part of the same project that Cato the Elder was involved in with his De Agricultura, at, just as Cato was interested in how to cure stuff. Pliny is invoking Cato saying like, hey, I'm not like Greeks. I'm like Cato, man. I'm going to tell you like real legit cures and protect you from uh, predatory doctors. And he does have a point. The medical marketplace in ancient Rome was full of unscrupulous medical professionals who were trying to make money off of their patients. This isn't a problem that medicine has really managed to shed, though, has it? I mean, we still have a medical marketplace where people pay money for unproven treatments uh, or where certain actors in the medical marketplace drive up costs for people who are desperate to afford life-saving treatments. This is going on in Rome too and it's important to know this as we read Roman medicine because that's the social context behind everything you're going to read in this course. This brings us to another author that um, in this crash course first week we're going to meet. So this is another hundred-ish years after Pliny the Elder. So he's born in about 129. He dies around 215 or 216 CE. This is Galen of Pergamon. And I've included him in this list uh, not because he identifies himself as Roman. In fact, he's very firm on the fact that no, no, I'm Greek. He writes in Greek. Uh, Cato and Pliny write in Latin. Galen writes in Greek. He's therefore Greek identifying, but he likely had Roman citizenship because eventually he gets one of the best jobs a doctor can get. That is, he becomes personal physician to the emperor Marcus Aurelius. And when Marcus Aurelius dies, he keeps his job and then he's physician to Commodus. And then he seems to keep his job still into the next dynasty, which is a pretty darn nifty trick. So Galen was as successful during his lifetime as a doctor could get this is yeah 
like he he's a lucky lucky dog and that's partially why we're still talking about him but there's another reason galen of pergamon was a compulsive self-publicist he wrote a lot he had a lot of students and he was also a tireless self-promoter this is how he gets to be the physician to the emperor is he is absolutely shameless about telling you why he is awesome and the work you'll be reading on prognosis isn't really about on prognosis. So prognosis was a part of ancient medical clinical practice. It is the practice of looking at a patient and predicting the course of the disease and using that prediction to settle on a treatment. And this is still an important part of medicine, right? One of the first things you ask when you're diagnosed is, okay, doctor, what's the prognosis? It's the same word in Greek. I mean, it's, we still use this concept but it's not just a technical thing it's also a social strategy that's very important to how galen manages his career i'll talk about this more later the short version is this is how you get jobs is when an important roman got sick they'd invite a few doctors over and then those doctors would fight over who gets to have the patient and the wealthy roman's friends would come watch the fight and then whoever won the debate got to treat the patient and if they screwed up the next guy went and so on and so forth um, so that is the social context behind on prognosis so on prognosis even though it's titled to you know it's, it, galen doesn't actually tell you in any systematic way how to form a prognosis it is in fact an infomercial for why galen is the best doctor and you should hire him one of the best ways to wrap your head around Galen and to kind of get an, get an image in your head of who this guy is and how you should hear his voice in your head when you're reading his stuff. Uh, first, his works were meant to be performed. I mean, yes, they were written down, but in the ancient world, you didn't just read a book silently to yourself. You would read it aloud in front of friends. Remember Pliny the Elder? This is how Pliny the Elder experienced reading, as somebody would read to him and likely he read bits of his own book it was a performance art so galen's on prognosis is meant to be stand up so you have to imagine galen delivering it like a speech which explains why it's so damn chatty it takes him forever to get to the point it's a feature not a bug and it also explains all of the stories like he goes from story to story about oh i once had this patient where da 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 and then this other doctor was wrong but i was right and everybody saw i was right and they laughed at him and they liked me because i am awesome there's even this one part where he says oh my gosh you guys like people sometimes mistake me for a wizard because i'm so good at prognosis but it's not wizardry i'm just that good like and then he goes on to say and if you're good at prognosis you have to be careful because people will accuse you of witchcraft which is an interesting self-promotion strategy galen and that's super cute um so one of the things i do is a thought experiment uh, if you're familiar with the show if not don't worry but if you've ever seen an episode of house md that's galen so just kind of imagine american hugh laurie giving on prognosis and then you've got the general idea here uh, galen is uh, really full of himself but he's super successful it works so if you learn nothing else from galen of pergamon putting yourself out there is a really good way to win history because Galen wins medical history. He writes so much and publishes so much and works so hard to convince everybody that he is the only right doctor in Rome that people believed it for millennia. Yeah. Oh, one other note, sorry. I mentioned who the portrait is for Cato. Uh, that is, we don't know, but plausible. Um, this portrait here, was drawn by a student of mine. She's in grad school now, uh, Flora Kirk. But this is my, my picture of Uncle Plenty. I commissioned fan art. I, I'm i really fond of him, sorry. We'll have problematic favorites. Okay, so let's move away from our authors for a minute to talk about who's practicing medicine in Rome. And here I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to quicken this up a bit. 
you had a real combination of people offering healthcare, starting with traditional type practitioners. These are people who may not be literate, and that's not considered a problem for most Romans. In fact, not even upper class Romans require literacy. It's considered sort of a fancy posh move to be like, yeah, your doctor has to read. And we tend to be like, about that. But that's showing our own bias a little bit. These are people who served apprenticeships, who had a lot of firsthand experience and who could be very technically proficient. And that is a way that medical information is still passed down, right? We don't just let people learn medicine out of a book. We make them go to med school and then they have to do a residency and then they have to like pass practical exams. We never would let somebody be a doctor without making sure that when their hands are on a patient, they're going to be able to cope. So when we look at traditional practitioners, we should be a little cautious to dismiss them outright. For most of people in the ancient world, this is who their doctor was. And this was standard of care. But religious adjacent people are also part of healthcare. Still in the modern era, religion is a part of the full social context of health. Your belief system dramatically influences the way you understand your body when well and sick. It mediates the way that you cope mentally with the experience of sickness, physically and mentally. In the ancient world, religious professionals were part of the first line responders for healthcare, both mental and physical. Dream interpreters were also a part of diagnosis. In fact, doctors would regularly consult with a dream interpreter or ask the patient about their dreams as a, a way to get at a diagnosis and to hone in on prognosis. And this is a period where they still aren't quite sure where the mind-body connection is, and they take a very holistic view towards that. As I mentioned, uh, free Greek identifying physicians are pretty active in the Roman world, uh, not necessarily just in the upper crust either. It seems that there's a real preference for people with Greek-sounding names to practice as practitioners of medicine. This doesn't however mean you're from Greece. In fact, only a small percentage of people with names in the Greek language were from mainland Greece. A lot of them were from southern Italy. There are a lot of Greek-speaking colony states in southern Italy, um, southern France, bits of Spain, North Africa. They could many, in fact, most of our medical authors in this course are not from mainland Greece writing Greek. In fact, I think all of them are from the Near East. Anatolia. Galen, he's from modern day Turkey, Pergamon. That's still one of the powerhouses for medical training and medical knowledge. Uh, Kos, the putative home of Hippocrates, is right off the coast of modern day Turkey. So this remains a place that's strongly associated with good physicians. But it's not just Greek identifying physicians either. Egyptian physicians were also felt to be very effective and a lot of them also spoke Greek. So you had this nexus of identities that intersected. Some of these free Greek identifying physicians who spoke Greek and read Greek and trained in Greek would have Roman citizenship. Some of them would not. And this means that they had a Roman identity as well as a Greek identity that overlapped and bled into each other and is going to be important when we get to the law bit. Now, a lot of physicians were either enslaved or formerly enslaved so much that many, if not most, medical professionals at some point in their training would have been enslaved. It's such a regular part of slavery culture that Roman law has rules for how to deal with enslaved people with medical knowledge and training and how to go about freeing them while ensuring that the person who had formerly enslaved them still benefits from their investment in that person's practice. Once freed, you had some advantages. You got automatic Roman citizenship if you've been freed by a Roman citizen. This gave you some protection, but also some liability because you still had responsibility to the family of the people who had owned you. They also change your name. When you're freed, you're supposed to take your former enslaver's name. This is a feature of 
slavery name patterns in the American South too. So we're familiar with this kind of exchange. But what's very different about ancient slavery is there's no systematic effort to keep enslaved people illiterate. To the contrary, you are more valuable if you're literate. And this means that trafficked people are regularly educated, but we should be very cautious about seeing this as a good thing. These are trafficked people being educated so that their uh, traffickers can profit even more off of owning them. That's not a happy thing, I think. I know, I, I'm going to go to the bad on this one. Uh, as I mentioned, these physicians include women. There are female physicians who go by medica, which is just the female version of medicus. Medicus is a doctor in Latin, medica is a lady doctor. In fact, you're looking at a tombstone for one of them. Uh, we're missing her name, but you can see her job title here, medica. And they're more like this. This is how we document that. But OBGYN practices, sometimes you'll see this translated midwife. I don't think this is fair. Unlike modern midwives, they didn't practice with the physician's supervision. They had independent practices that often veered into family practice as well. So obstetrician, OBGYN, is a better rendering of the dynamic here. So these are women who had full freestanding medical practices. And if you were yourself a woman in antiquity, your primary provider of health care would likely be another woman. And these women professionals made large amounts of money, enough that they could donate buildings to their hometown. Uh, they were very influential in professional guilds, and they did have some perks under Roman law, including uh, salary guarantees. This means that in the Roman world, one of the good news items is that if you were female, you had a pretty good chance of a viable independent medical practice. In fact, women were going into medicine at rates that we don't really see again, at least in Europe, until like the 70s. So uh, there's some good news here. Yay. Go ancient lady doctors. You also had an interest in the Roman army in recruiting and training physicians and physicians' aides. So the military medicus, uh, medici is the plural, is a big part of the way you get trained, but also the way that Roman military institutions provided health care to frontline troops. This is the beginning of what later becomes the military medic and first responders, paramedics. Romans don't invent this, but they do create a system for supporting, recruiting, and maintaining this. And for a lot of veterans, this does become a path to a professional life after service. Finally, we need to talk about schools or sects of medicine. So this is the last big ticket item in our tour of everything you need to know about medicine going into Roman medicine specifically. These are three major sects or approaches to the human body that were active in the Roman Empire. These aren't the only ways of treating the body, and these aren't mutually exclusive either. A lot of physicians on the ground seem to have combined elements of one approach or the other, but these categories get used to talk about some very different ways of approaching theory, healthcare, and treatment. And they come out of moments that are important to understand what's going on in the theory. So without further ado, let's start with the two older ones. This represents a split amongst physicians in the Hippocratic tradition. So this is once the Hippocratic corpus has started to circulate as a body of texts and doctors are using them as part of their training. There's a division that arises amongst practitioners of medicine in how one should use the legacy of the Hippocratic corpus. And this falls into two big camps, dogmatics, who take their cues from the word dogma in Greek, which means teaching or theory. So these are doctors who believe in what they call evident and unseen causes. What the hell are those? I'll tell you. 
evident causes are causes that are obvious, observable, and provable. This can be as obvious as a rock has hit the patient's head. The patient's head is now an open wound and the skull is dented. The evident cause of the patient's illness is a rock to the head. Right, that's an evident cause. But it can also be something like this cut has pus coming from it. It is inflamed. It is on a body that has now become sick. Therefore, it is a provable and demonstrable cause of illness in that body. It is an evident cause of disease. It's a cause you can look at, you can diagnose, and you can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this process is causing this illness. An unseen cause is a cause of disease that you cannot directly observe. And here's where theory comes in, this dogma that gives dogmatics their name. The main theory they're referring to here is the theory of humors. If you believe that a little bit too much yellow bile in the region of your liver is causing pain, you can't directly observe that there's yellow bile there. You can observe that the patient is vomiting yellow bile, but you have to take a leap of faith in believing that the source of the pain and the source of the yellow bile are one and the same. Now, part of how they go about bridging that gap is through dissection and experimentation, and possibly at certain points, vivisection of humans, definitely at many points, vivisection of animals. That is, uh, opening a body for investigative purposes while the person or animal is still alive. This is a major part of how anatomical research is conducted, and it causes a big ethical divide between these two camps around the subject of human vivisection. We can't go into that too much in the scope of this class, but I should point out here that Now I'm going to wait until I get to the empirics to go over this too much, but allegedly hardcore dogmatics were willing to take criminals, cut them up while they're still alive, and use that to figure out what's going on inside the body in order to get at these unseen causes of disease. Allegedly, again. So from these investigations, they come to the conclusion, probably driven a little bit by observational bias. Yes, if you think you're going to see something, you tend to see it, that humors are real and important. And they also get this idea that the humors are important, but there's this other thing some of them say called pneuma, which is they felt like a fifth humor. This is the the element that you get from breathing that enters your body, and they believed that the flow of pneuma, this um, humorified air, is what allows your body to feel sensation. And as evidence, they'd say that you know when you sit on your foot and your foot loses sensation, what's happening is that you've squished it so that blood is still flowing, but the pneuma, the breath, isn't getting to it, so it can't feel sensation. And they believe that nerve tissue conducted this pneuma in the same way that blood vessels conduct blood, although some of them thought that pneuma is in the blood, maybe. Again, there's not a lot of unity on details. This is just very big, broad strokes here. Some of this they figured out through these vivisection experiments. Part of why you vivisect is that you can't figure out how nerve conduction works really well in a dead body in this period. You need to do it to a living body. Ugh. Finally, they're kind of big picture ideas. That the Hippocratic writings are super authoritative, that even when we're doing new research, we have to bring it back to the Hippocratic authors. And even though our facts may change, we still look to Hippocrates as our inspiration. And we try to use the groundwork in the Hippocratic corpus as our theoretical mainframe that we plug our new data into. Okay, so that's dogmatics in a nutshell. 
Opposite them are the empiricists, who are not non-Hippocratics. Uh, they also believe that the Hippocratic writings are authoritative, but they take it in another direction. They say, yeah, the Hippocratic writings are authoritative in that Hippocrates demonstrates the value of rational explanations for things and careful experimentation, but that as experience grows and our data set grows, so too our knowledge will change. So they're more okay with updating what they see as factual errors in Hippocrates in the Hippocratic writings, sorry. And they are less bound by the theoretical underpinnings of Hippocratic humoralism. They take their name from the Greek word for experience or empera, which is also the word for to try, to test. And they are in some ways the earliest adopters of um, scientific method 1.0. So they believe that unseen causes are dangerous that if you can't directly observe the cause, then you have not proven a cause, that unseen causes are theoretical, unprovable, and misleading. And they point out that when you cut into a body, you're destroying the structure of the body. What you see when you cut open the body isn't necessarily what the body looked like before you cut it open. Therefore, they say, yeah, you can cut up all kinds of people, living and dead, but what you learn about is just what a dead body looks like. And they also point out that there are limits to the practical applications of cutting open people, especially living people. They point out, quite rightly, that if you cut into the thoracic cavity, you're going to kill the person. And before the invention of a heart-lung machine, or hypodermic needles, or germ theory, or sterile surgery, you could not do thoracic surgery with any kind of margin of safety. So empiricists would point out, isn't it kind of cruel and messed up that we're spending all this time poking about in thoracic cavities when we can't responsibly operate on them? Like, what are we doing here, people? Now, here is where things take an interesting turn. They said that you don't have to dissect or vivisect, especially not human bodies, um, human cadavers. Uh, first, because Human cadavers have already been dissected, they said, and therefore you can just read what happened the last time someone dissected a human. You don't have to dissect a new human every time. Like, that's reinventing the wheel. That's silly. They'd also point out that it's misleading information. Um, it's not necessarily safe. The information you get isn't all that great. And here is where it becomes creepy. They say that it's a lot better while you're treating somebody and, you know, if there just happens to already be a hole in the body there, poke around and see what you can find. You know, just check it out while you're in there and then you can slowly learn anatomy that way. This is a practice modern people, not ancient people, but modern people call opportunistic vivisection. And this, for empiricists, was their ethical alternative to human cadaver dissection. Now, a note about human cadaver dissection. You'll hear people on the internet and elsewhere tell you that nobody ever dissected cadavers in the ancient world. Uh, not true. Systematic cadaver dissection in the way we do in med school, that's not a thing. There isn't the central sourcing of bodies. There's no taboo. It's not illegal, no matter what Wikipedia tells you. That's wrong. I like wrote a paper about it. Uh, however, it's not being done in a systematic fashion. There isn't a steady supply of bodies and the bodies being used are often compromised. They're old or doctors on battlefields will like take the enemy dead and just sort of poke around in them. It's, um, it's not the kind of environment that leads really good reproducible results. And it's also not the kind of thing you advertised. Uh, in an environment where Romans are worried already that you're experimenting on them and you're super shady, messing around with dead bodies tends to put your prospective patients off, but they're perfectly okay with animal bodies. However, even Galen um, tacitly admits to doing some work with human cadavers and he nods to other people who did. All of this is to say that, you know, nobody would show up in a rescue for dissecting a human cadaver in antiquity. They might think you're creepy, but they wouldn't 
arrest you unless you were uh, dissecting somebody's relative and even then the laws on the books aren't really great for defending that uh, more likely you would just get chased by an angry mob finally uh, on to the other details of empirics so what did they do instead of dogma like what was their alternative to these theoretical humoral caused diseases well they offered this alternative clinical model called the tripod which is a tripod because it's got three legs on it like a tripod yes yes tripod it's three legs. so leg number one is observation so this is a careful and reproducible observation of the patient including the getting and keeping of reliable patient histories so this is all about carefully observing the facts as neutrally as possible the next leg is history now this isn't patient history like we use the term today in medicine rather this is your medical literature review this is your knowledge of other people's cases your reading of written reports of other people's cases the amount of an anatomical knowledge you've read this is just you know, your your book learning part of med school but also your professional networking you had to operate in a community if you were an empiricist in fact you always had to be in a community but empiricists made it a requirement of being a good empiricist and then finally analogy is the leg that ties all this together so analogy is the method by which you move from what is known to what is unknown the first two legs are all about making sure that what you know is what you know that you're observing only observable causes that you're not making any illogical leaps that you're getting good data and then analogy is where when you don't have an exact one-to-one -one correspondence you can say well this is a little bit like this and maybe the thing that works here will also work here let's try it and then like a good empiricist you tell a friend you write it down and then you build the body of medicine now both of these approaches to medicine are crucial in building the kind of rationalizing medicine that we're familiar with today you need both theory and anatomy and observation and good clinical practice and good professional communication to build a consensus about how the human body works but there is not consensus here it seems that these are warring factions that are also at war inside the factions with each other in part because of competition these are folks who are all competing for a limited pool of wealthy patients because once you get into doctors who can read doctors who have an education who have studied abroad for part of their medical education you have fewer and fewer doctors competing for even fewer and fewer patients for higher and higher rewards with the kind of escalating costs that inform what Pliny the Elder tells us when he's telling us what's wrong with doctors he's like oh my god they charge so much money and they like argue with each other over bullshit and you can't tell what they're talking about half the time part of his frustration is built out of this environment which only gets more complicated on the next slide as Greek medicine comes to Rome so here is the timeline Pliny the Elder gives us for how Rome encountered and incorporated Greek style medical practice and it begins in 219 BCE when Rome decided to do what other Mediterranean cities were already doing that is to pay a physician to move into the city and to run a practice out of a facility provided at state expense so the Roman Senate creates a shop front they bring in a surgeon named Archagathus from Sparta and they set him up in a shop we don't think that they necessarily paid for free treatment or we're not sure Pliny doesn't say but maybe there was some state-sponsored health care involved here but nonetheless it went sideways very quickly because Archagathus had a nickname he acquired in Rome that is the Carnifex which is the Latin word for the butcher this is not the nickname you want when you are a surgeon 
Interestingly, he seems to have been respected by his peers. Later doctors quote him and cite some of his procedures. So th this isn't a guy who is you know, on a blacklist for all time and medical history ever after. He might have been pretty competent. But surgery is a high risk practice in the ancient world. Yes, no germ theory. And Roman patients died and died horribly because ancient surgery, uh, there were some analgesics, but not anything that's really good or really reliable. Surgery was super painful and super traumatic and you could die from shock. Or that, I mean, it, surgery before the invention of ether, let alone the invention of germ theory was extremely high risk with a huge body count. Um, to illustrate, let me tell you one of my favorite modern medical history stories. That is the story of Robert Liston and the surgical procedure with the highest mortality rate on record. This is not the kind of record you want to get, by the way. So Robert Liston had a 300% mortality rate from a single procedure because when he was amputating a leg, he went a little bit too fast because back in the day, uh, going fast when you didn't have blood transfusions let you operate so that your patient wouldn't bleed out. But he cut so fast that he removed his assistant's fingers and the patient's leg, and one of the spectators watching, because uh, surgery was often a spectator sport, had a heart attack and died. So a spectator died, his surgeon whose fingers got cut off got gangrene, he died, and then the patient also got gangrene and died. So that's the 300% mortality rate from a single surgery. One patient, three dead people. Good job, Liston, good job. Uh, despite that, he was really well respected. He, he was actually a pretty good surgeon. Just, it's hard to live that one down, isn't it? Oh, Robert Liston. I say all of this to illustrate why things would have gone badly for Archagathus, because remember the social context he's practicing in. He's a Greek, he's a Spartan, he's practicing in Rome, the Senate went out on a limb and sponsored him, and patients start dying, and people like, say, no, Cato the, Cato the Elder is alive for this, so, oh dear. <laughs> if you see the problem. Yeah. It goes sideways. Archagathus is driven out of town and Roman doctors have a really hard time coming back from this ever after. In fact, in the years 161 and 91 BCE, the Senate actively expels Greek intellectuals from the city of Rome, including all the doctors. They just round them up and kick them out of the city. They come back almost immediately, but the fact that Rome is getting this hostile tells you a lot about the practicing conditions. Now, in the middle of this, however, Rome tries again with Asclepiades of Bithynia. So this was a teacher of rhetoric who switched careers midlife to become a physician. But this shouldn't make you immediately think he's sketchy. This is not unheard of for ancient intellectuals. And he was headhunted by a number of royal courts, including the one of Mithridates of Pontus, who was Rome's public enemy number one at the time. So Rome poached him. They got him to move to Rome instead of to Pontus, and they bragged about it ever afterwards. So when Asclepiades went to Rome, he had a an inn that a lot of other Roman doctors didn't have because he was letting Rome get one over on a foreign enemy. Now, the other thing Asclepiades did that was clever is he came up with another approach to the human body and medicine that worked really well in the social context he was practicing in in Rome. And that is an idea that the body may include humors. So he, he believed that, yeah, there are humors, but the important thing is not so much the fluids that are in the body or how they're mixed or where they are. It's about how well the flow within the body is working. How well are particles uh, moving from one part of the body to another? Are they getting blocked up? Are they moving too quickly? And how do we rebalance them early? How do we intervene before something gets to be a bad disease? From this idea, he comes up with one of the 
best ideas ever to hit medicine, the idea of passive exercise. That is, putting the patient in a hammock or giving them a massage or putting them in a nice warm bath in order to affect the flow of particles through a part or the whole of their body. So because you're trying to get the particles to flow more freely or more slowly or just balance out, the ways you do that would be by like rocking the body and shaking it and settling your particles in your pores, heating it, cooling it. All of these are pretty low impact interventions, certainly compared to surgery, low impact. They can have an effectiveness and they are the kind of interventions that make sense to Romans. Romans also appreciate that they've got this new theory that doesn't sound like the sorts of theories coming out of the rest of the Greek world. This feels more local, more homegrown, somehow more trustworthy. In the first century BCE, Temesin of Laodicea, is one of Asclepiades students, takes Asclepiades' ideas and founds a sect proper that he calls the Methodists, which is our third major faction of doctors. So here they are. Their word methodikoi is a compound that means a roadmap or on the road. So this is meant to be a roadmap to health. And it's also the word that gives us method in English is this word in Greek too, methodos. This is meant to be a method, an easy to understand, easy to explain way of understanding and treating the body. So I've mentioned the particle and pore thing. Um, they were very interested in what they called the common features of disease, the koinotes. That is, they believed all disease was characterized either by a flux, a flow that was too fast of particles, or constriction there was not enough flow, that flow was blocked. And the third state was a mixed state where you're uh, constricted somewhere, you're flowing too fast. In another place, you, your flow balances out of whack. Methodist physicians then, their first order of business when observing a patient was to try to figure out, okay, is this a constriction disease or a flow disease or like, does it have features of both? Is it chronic or is it acute? Like, is this developing over a long time or is this a serious short-term disease? Depending on which, you're gonna intervene either more aggressively or more gently, depending on how much time you have to work with. And then they bought heavily into the idea of graduated levels of treatment. They believed in starting with the lowest impact intervention that was responsibly viable. So this doesn't mean they didn't ever just start with surgery. If they felt that it was serious enough, they would. But their first stop would not be surgery. They'd try regimen and diet and then exercise and then escalate and escalate through pharmacy and harder drugs. And then finally into surgery and cautery at last resort. This also included a lot of extreme dieting, too. I mentioned the passive exercise thing. There was also a lot of strategic use of bathing facilities, which is something Romans loved anyway. Critics of Methodism accused these doctors of just catering to wealthy Roman patients by giving them a medical excuse to do stuff they wanted to do anyway. They thought that this was just horribly irresponsible physicianing that Methodist physicians were sucking up to wealthy people and taking their money and giving them stupid cures that weren't actually cures at all. Now, one of the main proponents of this view of Methodism was Galen, because guess who Galen's main competitors were for Roman patients? Yes, Methodists. So Galen made it his mission in life to tell you that Methodists were the worst doctors ever. He said things like, oh, they only go to med school for six months, they like have this ridiculously short training period and they don't have any proper medical education, they don't read things, they never dissect anything. Um, this is hard to prove because very few actual Methodists have survived because after Galen, people believed him. And so they stopped copying Methodists. Uh, so we lost, so much medical knowledge from that stream because people were like, oh, Methodists, they're idiots, with one exception. Serranus of Ephesus. 
who wrote on gynecology in a way that Galen didn't. He had information that Galen couldn't replicate, and therefore he stuck around. So we've still got him, and from him we realized that Methodists had a lot of really good ideas, actually, and did represent some very innovative players in medical treatment, and also some good proponents of preventative medicine and careful equations of risk-benefit analysis. They were a useful counterbalance to some very harmful practices coming out of dogmatic and empiricist spaces, including radical bleeding, um, in, in some cases medicalized rape is a thing that happened in some um, treatments for women's health conditions. There's a lot you can say for the Methodists. Oh, also, this is unrelated, but um, these are the baby pictures for my cat, Cato. He's super cute, isn't he? Um, he's not relevant. I just named him after Cato because he's super cranky and he's very mean to his sister. And he eats cabbage. <laughs> he's a really weird cat, but I love him. Isn't he cute? Okay, so that's it. That is my crash course. Everything you need to know about the world of Roman medicine, Roman doctors, and Roman healing. Uh, more specifics will be in the Galen lecture about Galen. Buckle up, guys. This first week is going to be a lot, but it's going to set you up for a lot less work in future weeks, and that's why I've kept discussion real light. Okay? Okay, this is done. I'm going to put it in the can and put it on YouTube. Welcome! Nice to meet y'all. See you on Collaborate.